I met him when I was 18. And I began in the, the year later, in 34, I began analysis with him. We went out there to the tower and uh, out of the bushes suddenly we were standing around kind of, you know, awkwardly as one does, <laughs> not knowing what was going to happen. And then out of the bushes came a man and I was deeply impressed by him. I thought he, naturally he was a Methuselah because I, when you are 18 you think a 58-year-old is a... Is a <laughs> ready for the cemetery. He told that story which you can read in the memories about this girl who was on the moon and had to fight a demon and the black demon got her. And he pretended, he, or he told it in a way as if he, she really had been on the moon and it had happened. And I was very rationalistically trained from school, so I, I said indignantly, but she imagined to be on the moon, or she dreamt it, but she wasn't on the moon. And he, he looked at me earnestly and said, yes, she was on the moon. I still remember looking over the lake there and thinking, and either this man is crazy or I am too stupid to understand what he means. And then suddenly it dawned on me, he means that what happens psychically is the real reality. And the, this other moon, this stony desert which goes round the earth, that's illusion or that's only pseudo-reality. And that hit me tremendously deeply. When I crawled rather drunk into bed because he gave us a lot of burgundy, that evening I thought it'll take you ten years to digest what you experience today. Both Jung and I minded most of all about wholeness, about the coming whole, and that I got at it through my art by always trying to draw paintings that looked whole, animals, primitives, anything, anything that seemed still at one with itself and whole. And he got at it by studying the things that were wrong with people and then realizing the way to, cure, to get it right was to find their wholeness, to find the opposite to the thing that was destroying them so terribly. And of course I went through a tremendous uh, encounter with the unconscious one always does in analysis. Particularly with him, he didn't let you pick flowers by the way, sort of. <laughs> when you met him in the club or when you met him privately or in analysis, it, it was always a man interested in the I would like to use the word in the supernatural food, uh -huh. always, yeah. into the depths. And you see, you could come into his room in analysis, and he was just speaking about the dreams you had had before, last night, not knowing them, but he was, he was involved. He was so transparent for people. And that was a fascinating thing in the relationship with Jung. Oh. And therefore, everybody who knew Jung had the feeling uh, he speaks one's own language. We started talking, and I went home with him afterwards. And uh, to Mrs. Jung's despair, we sat talking until about three o'clock in the morning without break. And again, it was uh, I had this very strange feeling, although it was snowing outside bitterly cold, that I was sitting round uh, one of the first fires in a camp somewhere in the bush in Africa, talking, as you can only talk in those conditions. And I said to him, why don't you come back to Africa with me? He said, you know, when I came back from Mount Elgin and from Kenya and living amongst the witch doctors of Africa, he said, I found so much witchcraft in Switzerland 
I felt that I had to deal with all this witchcraft first before I could, um, you know, before I could travel again. And he used to refer to himself uh, as an old witch doctor. Very often when people asked him, are you a Protestant, are you a Catholic? He said, don't ask me these questions. He said, you know, I'm only an old African who finds his God in his dreams. And he really meant that. He really meant that. We had this tremendous uh, human, almost animal warmth and immediacy. It was the immediacy of the laugh that got one. Uh, Schopenhauer said that humour was the only divine quality of man. Hmm. And that Basel helped him with a lot. Basel, the Baslers have an extraordinary sense of humour. And their carnival is really marvellous. Jung uh, took you there once to the Yes, Basel. he did. A whole lot of us. We went there the night before and got up at four o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, I think to see the so-called Morgenstreich. And the procession comes through with lights. It's most impressive. This feeling that he had that if man lived his life religiously, if he lived his life symbolically, then it, all, it was almost as if what the theologians called God, and my Zulus called Mkulu Mkulu, the first spirit, where the first spirit had passed over some of his power and some of his responsibilities to the human being. And that the human being had a godlike task to perform in creation. And the extent to which he performed it, he derived his meaning. It's a very important part of Jung's thinking. Oh, well, I just paid a visit to him in Vienna, and, and then we talked for uh, 13 hours without interruption. 13 hours for without 13 interruption. 13 hours without interruption. We didn't, we didn't realize that we were almost dead at the end of it, but it was tremendously interesting. He was uh, the old man and had a great experience, and he was, was way ahead of me, and so I settled down to learn something first.
I had written that book that cost me my friendship with Freud because he couldn't accept it. Yes. Uh, he, he, to him, the unconscious was a, a, a product of consciousness. Yes. Uh, and it simply contained the remnants. I mean, it was sort of of a storeroom where all the discarded things of consciousness were were heaped up and left. And but to to me, the unconscious then was already a, a matrix, a, a, a sort of a basis of consciousness of a creative nature, namely capable of autonomous acts, uh, autonomous intrusions into consciousness. Man's soul is, is a complicated thing and it, it takes sometimes half a lifetime to get somewhere uh, in one's psychological development. You know, it is by no means always a matter of uh, psychotherapy or treatment of neurosis. It, it, it is all psychology has also the aspect of a... a pedagogical method in in the widest sense of the of, of the word um, it is system something of education. it is an education it is something like antique philosophy and not uh, uh, what we understand by a technique it, it is something that touches upon the whole of man and which challenges also the whole of man in the patient or uh, whatever uh, the receiving part is, as well as in the, in the doctor. One of the tremendous uh, things which Jung did was to always emphasize the aspect of man's totality. And our totality is not complete unless we take our human failings into it. It doesn't mean that I necessarily have always to live my human failings. I obviously may have to take responsibility for them. But they are not only part of me, but they are part of every human being. That is to say, it is part of man. Consciousness is one factor, and there is another factor, equally important, that is the unconscious that can uh, <clears throat> uh, interfere with consciousness any time it pleases. And of course, I, I, I say to myself now, uh, this is very uncomfortable, uh, because uh, I think I am the only master in my house, but I, uh, I must have, uh, admit that there is uh, another somebody in that house that can uh, play tricks. And I had to deal with the unfortunate victims of that interference every day in my patients. Analysis, proper, particularly human analysis, begins and ends with conscience. That is, that you take responsibility, that you take into consideration uh, uh, all those manifestations which so far have remained in the unconscious. In other words, you were not conscious of. And uh, if you start uh, taking the responsibility for those manifestations, like shadow qualities and whatnot, mm -hmm. then this is a very strong test for your conscience, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you have to, to you have, only have to think of the beginning of, of psychoanalysis. I mean, it, it, took an enormous amount of moral courage to face these facts, which so far have not been considered or repressed. I felt that Jung should tell me what I should do, 
whether I should write a book, whether I should uh, get a divorce, what I should do. And he wouldn't. And so I got mad at him. And uh, I uh, said, why is everybody so mean to me? And he said, why are you so mean to everybody? So I stormed out. And uh, you got what I said there. I said to him, why is everybody so mean to me? And he said, why are you so mean to everybody? That was the trigger point. I was gone for a year. And I wrote him, oh, I don't know. Every now and then I'd sit down at the typewriter and write him what a son of a bitch I thought he was. And how when I first got to Europe, Europe everyone thought he was a charlatan. I thought he was too. And, and uh, uh, I didn't, uh, he was the most conceited, vain man. And, and uh, I, you know, I really had a great time. And, um, and you sent all these letters? Sent the letters, of course I did. And I thought, I hope he drops dead of a stroke. And uh, I felt very good. I didn't, <laughs> I just felt fine. When I can get mad, my, I, f I can lose five pounds just by getting mad. It's <laughs> just the adrenaline goes, and I just think, you know, it's the opposite of poor little me. And it's, I don't care, they let the world go and stuff it up. I don't care what happens to them. And then um, one morning I woke up, and I began to laugh. I thought, for God's sake, what's been going on here? What a jack at you. And suddenly I realized, surely he really hit it. And so I phoned Miss Schmidt, Fraulein Schmidt, and asked if I could have an appointment. And she laughed and said, oh, yes, she said, Professor Jung told me to save some time for you. He thought you'd be calling shortly. And sometimes you be quite unfair to one. And he think he tell me at the club, for instance, she'd go and something be horrid to people. And then he'd go home saying, Now wasn't that nasty of me? I really Spoilt their weekend and saw shows on Saturday evenings. But when they next came to analysis, she found that that particular nastiness was exactly what they wanted, hmm. what they needed. I really got more from Jung when he hit me over the head than any other time. <laughs> I don't mean literally. <laughs> he had very small eyes and when he looked through those little eyes, or usually over the top of his uh, uh, eyeglasses, uh, you knew that he was looking at something that, that you couldn't see. And uh, what came out was usually some very simple uh, fact. It wasn't uh, any uh, aura or any great uh, message that came back from the beyond. It was uh, something about uh, your ordinary life or the ordinary situation. Now, I described a party where I felt the shadow got loose with Jung at the center of, of it, where they threw a, a knotted uh, towel from one person to another around a circle. Jung kept this thing going beyond, almost beyond endurance, and uh, I fell down and broke my glasses and somebody else uh, skinned a knee, and at the end of the party we were all in shambles, but uh, this was characteristic of Jung's intolerance of persona. He was, he was so afraid that the party would uh, stick on a polite persona level that he engineered it to bring out the shadow. And in the end, we all had a marvelous time. We all got drunk, and it, was, uh, it, it ended very happily. <clears throat> He became a human being, uh, and a total one. I mean, he included everything. <laughs> he, he could be terrible. <laughs> he could be terrible. He could be absolutely terrible. Oh, in these ways. Uh, uh, yeah. In these ways. I remember one, one thing when we, we sailed on the, on the lake up there, bowling, you know, in his boat, and, uh, and there was a car, the, the wind died down completely, and we were way up from from the tomb, you know, I see, yes. way off, and um, and so there was nothing else but to row. Uh -huh. And I was an old uh, sailor, and, and and you know, I, I I knew how to row indeed, better than he did, as a matter of fact. And also, so I went and rowed, 
And he started criticizing me for every single part of a movement I made with those <laughs> <rows>. <laughs> <laughs> And he knew it better, of course. Oh, and, and didn't he row himself? Uh, 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 Joan was in the boat as well, my wife, and so uh, it was absolutely, it was hell. It was real hell. Until I said, good, fine, do it yourself. Yes, but <laughs> you finally down. said. <laughs> <laughs> and he did it? Yes, he had yes, to. He had to if you gave he yes, had to. Yes. I wouldn't I wouldn't make one single move. Yes, so. And did he ever apologize for No, me? no. Oh really? no, he could be terrible. Oh yeah. he could be really dead. When I was his secretary he grumbled at me with a very loud voice. And he was uh, he, he didn't like when I took it personally. So I took it, and uh, sooner or later there was a big and very beautiful, as do we, how do you say, balloon or recompense, a compensation. Uh -huh. He compensated it. He knew exactly what he had done. And then he, one, one was um, rewarded. <laughs> if, one could, if one could stand it, and if one didn't uh, uh, took it personally. Mm -hmm. You see, he was so burdened by his ideas and by... Um, by people outside and his inner figures. So he, I understood it quite well. He had to have a um, let out, besides ventil. What uh -huh. is Ventilate. And uh -huh. vent out. Ventilate. The steam has to go out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it sometimes came out on you yes. when you were there. Yes, uh -huh. why not? Yeah. <laughs> the personal shadow is the personal shortcomings of uh, things which every human being could be conscious of, which is not archetypal. For instance, such things as greed for money or jealousy, inferiorities which everybody has, but uh, prefers not to know about. If one is jealous or if one is suddenly possessed by wanting money or so on, one, well, one could know about it if one is honest with oneself. But the collective shadow has to do with the dark side of the archetype of the self. That means it's the shadow of the God image. In the Christian tradition, it would be the devil. And that has always been personified and felt as something which has not to do with directly with the human being. I mean, if somebody is possessed by the devil, he's much worse than just He's not human, it's demonic. And, uh, but on the other hand, generally that merges. First you have this area of uh, dim, dark side, and behind it lurks the other. I've, for instance, seen that when Germany went to the devil in na Nazism, people fell into it through their personal shadow. For instance, they didn't want to lose their job because they were clinging to money. That was their personal shadow, but then they joined in with the Nazi movement for that reason and did much worse things than they would have done normally under normal social conditions. So you can say the personal shadow is the bridge to the collective shadow or the open door to the collective shadow, but the collective shadow comes up in those terrible mass psychoses. It's like if you have a room and there's one door on a chat and there the devil can come in. And if you know your personal shadow, you can shut all the doors. I think that it's quite a, an important fact historically 
that there were very few of us that um, intentionally became analysts. What happened was that we were all we all had neuroses and we were nice fat juicy ones and we were vibrating like an Aeolian harp in a high wind and um, uh, very often this was exacerbated by a, a marriage relationship and so that most of us of my generation didn't prepare to be an analyst but we went to an analyst so that he could tinker with our psyches and somewhere along the line we'd say wouldn't it be peachy if I could be one of those two I have to remember our first appointment because Joe and I went together and he talked right over the top of my head to Joe arranging my appointments and I finally said well where do I come in and he said oh that comes later and uh, I, I'll never forget that Jane and I arrived in, in Zurich in 1932 we had a very deep bond between the two of us, but we also were very dissimilar. And so um, we got into horrendous clashes and crashes. We uh, just were anxious to get a hold of something that would give us some tools to work with so that we could uh, resolve these clashes. I was not so enamored of him at first. I didn't, I thought uh, the way he talked, oh, no, it was his writing. Of course, it was very intuitive writing, and it wasn't my dish. And uh, I kept thinking, who the hell does he think he is? You know, how does he, uh, how do you know what he's saying? I mean, how does, how does he know what he's saying is, is right? And uh, I was really very resistant. It is almost a rule, but I don't want to make too many rules with him. <laughs> In order not to be schematic. Yes. Uh, that a, an introvert marries an extrovert for compensation or another type marries the counter type to, to complement himself. I thought, well, he's just talking through his hat and I just can't go for that stuff until I got in trouble and had him head on and then, my God, he just made all kinds of sense. I liked his opening comment. He said... Uh, Oh, so you're in the soup, too. <laughs> I like the two. <laughs> you could be in it together. Yeah. <laughs> the archetype is a force. It has an autonomy. It can certainly seize you. It yes. is like a seizure. Yes. So, for instance, falling in love at first sight, yes. that is such a case. You see, you have a certain image in yourself without knowing it of the woman, of the woman. Yes. Now you see that girl or at least a good imitation of your type. And instantly you get a seizure and you're, you're gone. And afterwards you may discover that it was a hell of a mistake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or you see, a man is quite capable, oh, he's intelligent enough to see that that woman of his choice, as one says, not no choice, he has been captured. Yeah. You know, he sees that she is no good at all, yes. that she is a hell of a business. And, and he, he tells me so, and he said, for God's sake, doctor, help me to get rid of that woman. <laughs> he can't. He's, he, he's like clay in her fingers. And that is the archetype. That is so called archetype of the animal. Yes, yes. He, he thinks it is all his soul, you know, uh, like the girls, you know. When, when a man sings very high, yeah. then he thinks he must have a very wonderful spiritual character because he can sing the high C. <laughs> yeah. and, and she's badly disappointed when she marries at that particular number. Yeah. Well, that is the archetype of the animus. Yeah. You know. This is built right into the center of, of Jung's whole, uh, whole psychology that one should uh, develop one's contrasexual components, uh, as Margaret Mead so quaintly phrases it. Um, but Jung prefers to talk about the animus and the anima, meaning the feminine side of the, uh, the masculine side of the woman and the feminine side of the man. And so that all of us who are, are really committed and involved in the, in the Jungian uh, world are very busy 
trying to develop our animuses or our animas, and we don't ever expect that it's going to be quite a dead heat, and that our voices will alternate from soprano to basso, uh, or that we are going to get a reissue uh, of our vital parts. But on the other hand, uh, we do feel that um, usually going on a two-step operation, first with the projection of one's anima or one's animus, and then the gradual uh, peeling of it off and, and re-taking uh, it back in again and, and assimilating it and hopefully integrating it into one's consciousness, that this, this androgynous or almost androgynous state of being is the way one hopes to be before they throw the switch. In the beginning stages of a relationship, there is generally a lot of projection mixed up with it. And that uh, is responsible for all those love quarrels. I mean, she makes demands which he can't fulfill, and he makes demands she can't fulfill, and animus anima uh, crossing the swords, and I mean, if you tape record a love quarrel, it's the same all over the world, literally. And, and that is projection. And if people don't run away, but work it out, and take back all what is projection in it, then appears or is peeled out of all this the true relationship. Now, it might be none. And then it would be like the Freudian thing, goodbye, and now, now I see you simply represented that and that in me, and thank you very much, goodbye. Or there might be a tremendous amount of relationship, true relationship built up, which is not the same thing as projection. The, the intensity of our struggle uh, uh, suddenly became clear to me that Jane was, had a thinking function developed, and I had a developed feeling function. And of course, that was upside down. Uh, everybody knows that men think and women feel, only what didn't happen to be so with us. But uh, I think that his, what he did for women came through his tremendous interest in the individual. And women could be individuals too. And this problem of what is feminine and what is masculine and so forth and so on almost uh, came as second to that. Mm -hmm. So I think in a sense, and then of course his discovery of the animus and the anima, that did a lot. Jung was not apt to be a father, father figure. He was in an astonishing way near to you. Hmm. Natural. He could sit down and after 10 seconds, you failed to speak with a brother, mm. not with a father. Mm. And if you have had this brother relationship to him, <coughs> were you discussed in a free way? Were you accepted that he got angry? Were you also were ready to get angry at him, as men do in mm. an upright, clear way? It was easy to get along with him. But the moment where one saw that he was a father figure, mm. he was for men very destructive. Because he was too irrational to be given guidance as a father. He changed too openly, too often his mind mm. to give such a guidance. That's a natural thing to change one's mind. Quite mm -hmm. a normal thing. But uh, a father should give a certain guidance. And he had no intention at all to give a guidance. So for men, it was often difficult because the moment uh, men look, and many men look for a father, mm -hmm. for a father, whereas with women it went along very much better because uh, a woman doesn't look so much for a father. She looks for a lover. Mm -hmm. And he was charming, seducing, and uh, there he offered a transference, often a little bit too much, ah. but with a great healing power, with a great healing power. Well, what about the atmosphere in Zurich at that time? Uh 
Well, that's what put me off. Oh, the cultism was just reeking. It was just awful. That was, there were the transferences. And I swore I would never get a transference. That, <laughs> I, that one thing I decided right away because it just looked too awful. I mean, these people were just goofy. And, uh, but I got a transference. It couldn't help it. it. Couldn't help it. Because, uh, I mean, after all, you get a transference because what's missing in you has got to be seen in somebody else. And there was plenty missing in me, you know, and with, a, with a man of, of Jung's caliber. There's a lot missing. It is a regular uh, observation that when you talk to an individual and this individual gives you um, insight into its uh, inner preoccupations, interests, emotions, in other words, uh, hands over uh, his uh, personal complexes. Then you get slowly and nilly willy into the situation of a, of a sort of authority, yes. uh, uh, a point of, you become a point of reference. Um, you know you are in possession of all uh, the important items in a, in a person's development. Now, you see, that creates an emotional relationship to the analyst. And that is what Freud called the transference, yes. which is a, a central problem of, um, of analytic psychology. It is just so as if these people had handed out the, their uh, whole existence. And uh, that can have very peculiar effects upon the individual. E either they hate you for it or they love you for it, yes. uh, but you are not indifferent to them. But I, I, I never felt as though I had too much transference. It didn't last too long because Jung, uh, the one nice thing about, or the good thing about him, was he gave so much of himself. He just gave you everything he had. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as though you had a hangover. You got it all, you know?